True Crime South Africa is published in conjunction with Arena Holdings, publishers of Times Live, Business Live, Sowetan Live and others. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent the views of Arena Holdings and its affiliates. The girls laugh and chat as they walk along the tree-lined road. The warm breeze brings with it the promise of another perfect summer day. One of the teenagers pauses for a minute, digging through her school bag to find the books she wants to show her friend. The silver bucky pulls up quietly just behind them. At first they don't even notice it's there. Then the man appears, and his disguise and the gun pointed at them changes their entire world forever. Get in, or I'll kill you. This is True Crime South Africa. I'm Nicole Engelbrecht, and you're listening to Episode 79, The Serial Crimes of Yaku Stain. This episode is sponsored by the upcoming South African action movie Indemnity. And true crime fans, this one is for us too. When a traumatised ex-firefighter in Cape Town wakes up next to his wife's murdered corpse, with no recollection of what transpired, he finds himself labelled as the prime suspect. He goes on the run and is soon hunted by a notorious police chief and an unknown third party. He must now fight for his life and find out who killed his wife before a conspiracy changes the course of a nation forever. Starring a proudly South African cast, with Jared Hadult in the lead, who by the way, did all of his own stunts, every single one. Jared, suspended out of a 21-story window, actually Jared. Starring alongside Jared are Gail Mabalane and Nicole Fortain in South Africa's biggest action film in terms of action sequences to date. Indemnity releases in cinemas on the 13th of May, and we've got two sets of double tickets to give away to two lucky True Crime South Africa listeners. The giveaway will run on True Crime South Africa's social media sites, and the winner will be announced on those same socials next Friday. I'm super excited about how South African film and television is growing. We're producing amazing content in this country, and I'm grateful to be able to help promote this. Thank you so much to Indemnity for supporting True Crime South Africa. Before we get into today's episode, I'd like to thank our new Patreon supporters for the week. A huge thank you goes out to Rebecca Swanepoel, Riette Lackey, Talana Mayer, Nikki van Royen, Candice van Dam, Susanna Holtzhausen, Evac, Emma Brown, David Braz, Susan, Claudia Flanagan, Mark Landsberg, and Lindsay for your support on Patreon. Thank you so much for your support, everyone. It really does make a huge difference. If you'd like to support the show on Patreon or PayPal, I'll leave a link in the show notes. If you like discounts, because who doesn't, head over to King Online for your health and beauty needs, print crowd for all your printing requirements, and use the code TCSA10 at checkout for 10% discounts and support the show at the same time. And you can also get 10% off when you order from Wallpaper Online by using the code TRUECRIME at checkout. Other forms of support that make a huge difference include following the show on social media, inviting your friends, family, postman, hairdresser and parole officer to listen and leaving reviews on the podcast platform you use to listen. The case I'm covering today is probably more well known by the moniker that the offender was given while he was still active, which was the Sunday Rapist. As I've explained before, I choose not to refer to serial offenders by their monikers for a few reasons. The first is that many serial offenders do revel in their monikers and even help the media to create the names they're known by, and I don't want to be someone that adds to that. The second, and probably the most important reason, is that so often in serial cases, the victims are either unidentified, or even when their names are known, they're not nearly as well known as the offenders' names. You know who Moses Atole is, don't you? But like most people, we can't name a single one of his victims. So in my mind, 
if we don't even know or remember the victim's names, but we do know and remember the offender's name, they don't get to also have a sensational nickname, at least not on my podcast. In this case, the moniker given to this offender is actually wholly inaccurate. Not only the Sunday part, because only the latter part of his series was actually committed on that day of the week, but also the rapist part, because that's not where his crimes ended. He would go on to become a murderer. And in fact, even when he was still being called that moniker in the press, he was already a murderer. I don't often have WTF moments when I'm researching, not because cases aren't shocking, but maybe because my WTF level has increased since I've been doing this podcast and all the research that comes with it. But this case gave me several of those moments. In researching this case, I used the episode of Heisgenoot Vare Levens Dramas and several documents related to the case, as well as insights from forensic psychologist Dr. Gerard Labaskakni, who worked on the linkage analysis on this case. Most of the victims in this case have had their identity withheld because they were minors when the crimes occurred, and also because of the law regarding the protection of the identity of rape survivors unless they choose to reveal their own identities. So let's get into Episode 79, The Serial Crimes of Yakustain. The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counselling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. The first reported incident in this series occurred on the 11th of November 2008. This case would eventually be registered as Count 37 on the offender's charge sheets, but the charge only involved kidnapping. On this day, an 11-year-old girl was walking home from a friend's house in Rustenburg when a man pulled up in a white bucky next to her. The man got out and was clearly wearing a disguise, dark glasses and a wig. He also had a gun, and with the gun held to her head, the child was forced to enter the man's vehicle. The documents I have does not detail any further crimes committed against the school, and it seems that in this first instance, the offender may have lost his nerve and released her without significant harm. This incident may well have been a trial run for this offender, because it would be some time before on the 22nd of June 2009, also in Rustenburg, a 15-year-old girl was forced into a vehicle at gunpoint by a man. As soon as he had the girl in his car, he told her to duck her head down. This would presumably be so that she couldn't see where they were going, and also so that if they drove past someone who knew the girl, she wouldn't be recognised. The offender took the young girl to a remote field some distance from where he'd abducted her and raped her there. He then made her remove her shoes and set her free. At this point, I'd like to clarify that in South African law, any form of sexual penetration without consent is considered rape. So there is quite rightly no distinction made between how that penetration occurs or into which orifice in the body. Oral, anal and vaginal penetration all fall under the rape law, and there is also no distinction made between the type of object used for this forced penetration. Rape could be digital, by means of a foreign object, rape with a penis, or oral rape, and it is all considered as the same level of sexual violation. For a long time this was not true in South Africa, and I shudder to think how many victims of digital or oral rape, for instance, were made to feel that the crimes committed against them were somehow less traumatic. Thankfully, that is no longer the case. I mention this because this offender did use various methods of penetration, and I'm not going to go into the details of how and what he did to whom, because from a legal standpoint, it is all rape. This 15-year-old victim 
seems to be the first case in which the offender really fully carried out his plans, and within five months, he would strike again. On the 2nd of November 2009, a 12-year-old girl was abducted from a street in Potrovstrom, which is 151 kilometers from Rustenburg. The girl was driven to a rural area and raped before being released. Four months would pass before, on the 14th of February 2010, a 16-year-old girl was taken from Funderbell Park, an hour away from Potrovstrom, and almost three hours' drive away from Rustenburg. Once again, the victim was taken to an isolated area some way away from where she was abducted, raped, and released. And it is at this point that the Sunday offences start to come into play. Only the offences committed from 2010 onward were actually committed on a Sunday, and even then, that train didn't last long either. On the 7th of March 2010, back in Rustenburg, a 16-year-old girl was abducted. During this offence, the perpetrator forced the victim to drink an alcoholic beverage before raping and releasing her. The introduction of alcohol into the mix would also be an added element of the offender's progression in his crimes. This, along with the reports from survivors, that the offender would ask them if they had boyfriends and compliment them on their physical features, speaks to what experts call pseudo-relationship behavior. This is when an offender will attempt to convince themselves that the victim is in some way agreeing to the act they're carrying out, or that they have some form of connection which warrants the rape in their mind. I would not go so far as to say it eases the conscience, but it appears that many serial offenders use this method to appease themselves, and it may add to the fantasy. This offender in particular also perpetuated the pseudo-relationship ideal by sometimes using sex toys on his victims along with lubricant. While this foreign object insertion may well be part of the fantasy for him, it likely also helped him to convince himself that he was somehow trying to pleasure his young, defenseless, and completely unwilling victims. Occasionally, the offender would have aborted attempts at abduction, often when the victim selected was a little older and perhaps physically stronger than the others. While it's impossible to say exactly how many of these aborted attempts at abduction took place during this time, as it's likely many victims would not have reported them, believing perhaps that no crime had occurred because they weren't physically harmed, it's important to understand that no person has the right to restrict your movements in any way, and any unlawful and intentional attempt to restrict your movements is kidnapping. Regardless of whether the person restricted your movement by force or threat, or whether they assaulted you in any way, locking you in a room because they, quote, just want to talk to you, end quote, locking the doors to a car so you cannot get out, hiding the house keys and locking the doors. All of this equates to unlawful restriction of movement and should be taken very seriously whether you know the person or not. In personal relationships, this often speaks to the desire to control, which can escalate very quickly. And in stranger encounters, as we see here, you do not know what this person's intentions are. So even if you get away unharmed, it's vital that you report this to the police. One such incident was reported on the 5th of August 2010 in Potrovstrom, when an 18-year-old girl was forced at gunpoint into a vehicle and she managed to escape. Then, just one month later, the offender escalated. Not only did his cooling-off period between crimes shorten significantly, but this time he took two victims at once, and one of the girls would not survive the ordeal. On the 5th of September 2010, 14-year-old Lazan Farmer was with her 16-year-old friend in Armstrong Lane, Erasmia, Pretoria, when a vehicle pulled up alongside them. A man dressed in a disguise and armed with a gun forced both girls into his vehicle and told them to duck down. 
Lazan's friend would later recount how the man had driven off and Lazan had slipped her hand into her friend's, squeezing it tightly. Then, within seconds, her friend let go of her hand, opened the car door and flung herself from the moving vehicle. Sadly, when Lazan Farmer fell from the moving vehicle, she sustained several injuries, including a broken neck. These injuries were not survivable, and Lazan's body was later discovered by a passerby. Lazan's friend would later report that when Lazan had tumbled from the vehicle, the offender had not even flinched. He just instructed her to pull the door closed and lock it, then mumbled, Oh, I thought we were going to have a threesome, and then just carried on driving. Lazan's friend had been horrified to watch the girl fall from the car, but held on to the hope that her friend might be able to get help, and then she had to refocus her attention on her own very dire situation. The girl was taken to an area off Henops Rafia Road, forced to drink alcohol, raped and then released. She walked several kilometres barefoot before eventually flagging down a passing vehicle. At this point, as you would likely have realised, all of these crimes have happened in very different areas, some many hours' drive apart. The cases have been reported to different police stations, and because, sadly, rape is not an uncommon crime, no links have been made between these crimes just yet. After the murder of Lazanne Farmer, two more crimes would take place, and then all the pieces would start to come together for one very persistent detective and one very wide-awake forensic artist. On the 19th of September 2010, in Coltonville, almost two hours from where Lazanne Farmer was murdered and her friend was raped, a 15-year-old girl was abducted, raped and released. Then, on the 31st of October 2010, the serial predator would take his youngest victim yet, and simultaneously trigger a series of events that would result in his capture. But sadly, not before he'd inflicted even more horror. When an 11-year-old girl and her parents reported that she'd been abducted and raped in Krugersdorp, the case was assigned to Captain Piet de Toy of the Krugersdorp Child Protection and Sexual Offences Unit. The girl had been abducted from Krugersdorp West and taken to an area half an hour away called Heckbuert, where she was raped and released. After walking some time, barefoot and terrified, the child came upon a farmhouse and she was able to summon help and was given a lift home. When Captain de Toy spoke with the girl, she was understandably traumatised and unable to remember much detail. She could tell him that the perpetrator was a white male in his early thirties and that he'd been wearing dark glasses and a wig. The man had been driving a white Pajero, and this detail was confirmed by eyewitnesses who later came forward having seen the girl forced into the vehicle. The toy visited the scene of the abduction and that of the rape with the victim and her mother, took photographs and recorded the GPS coordinates. Captain de Toy was understandably not particularly hopeful that an identicate would produce any results because of the disguise the offender was wearing, but he sent the girl to meet with the region's forensic artist, Warrant Officer Cornet Brits. When Warrant Officer Brits completed the identicates and the victim had left, she called de Toy aside. She told him that she'd just done another identicate for a case in Coltonville, and the similarities were striking. She'd also been speaking with colleagues in Funderbale Park, Erasmia and Potchefstroom, and they'd reported hearing about similar cases in their jurisdictions. The two officers realised they very likely had a serial rapist and murderer of at least one on their hands. One of the first things a detective will do when they suspect a series of this magnitude is to gather all the dockets and make an appointment with the investigative psychology unit. 
The officers in this unit are specially trained to identify and help work serial offender and other psychologically motivated crimes. At this time, Dr. Gerard Labaskakni was the unit's head. Captain Detoy approached the various police stations in the relevant areas and was initially able to gather eight dockets with similar modus operandi, including the dockets in which Lausanne Farmer was listed as a murder victim. For the most part, these case investigations had all stalled as there was so little information available to work with. Importantly, none of these cases had produced any DNA evidence, which is so absolutely vital in finding these types of serial offenders. The more Captain Detoy read through the dockets, the more he realised why he was not finding DNA. The perpetrator was extremely careful about ensuring he left nothing behind. He often either raped his victims digitally or with a foreign object. When he raped them orally, he forced his victims to wipe their mouths out with wet wipes, which he'd had in his vehicle, or made them drink and rinse their mouths out with alcoholic beverages. When he raped them with his penis, he would either wear a condom or not ejaculate. So Detoy's next step was to reactivate all of the stalled dockets and get them centralised to his units so that he could investigate all of them at once. And there began one enormous task for the detective, who was essentially working on his own. Although the witnesses and survivors had been interviewed initially, with the new information Detoy had about possible linkages, he wanted to do fresh interviews with everyone. Also, it's often helpful for survivors to put some time between the traumatic events and their interview, as the brain might block out certain details in the first few hours that over time will come back to the victim and they'll be able to offer more information. So that was his first step. Interview everyone on all eight cases he was looking at. With that mammoth task completed, he returned to the scenes. Each case had at least two scenes of importance, the place of abduction and the scene of the rape. De Toy visited each, took photographs of the area and recorded GPS coordinates. These coordinates would become absolutely vital evidence in this investigation. De Toy knew that if he could narrow down a list of possible perpetrators, the GPS coordinates could be compared to the cell phone data of those suspects and help narrow it down. He sent the list of coordinates to various cell phone service providers in those areas and asked for them to provide the details of, of which towers cell phones would be pinging off if a person was in those spots. With all of his interviews and initial work completed, the toy sat down with the IPU and the unit was able to confirm that the eight crimes in question were very likely all committed by the same perpetrator. One thing that stood out in this linkage analysis is the fact that the perpetrator was in a vehicle. Now, this may sound strange, but bear with me. The vast majority of serial rape offenders in South Africa do not have access to a vehicle. This is something that makes our crimes of this nature quite different from other countries with different socio-economic makeups. While there are very often many serial rapists operating in our country at any given time, almost all of them are either luring victims to certain locations on foot or they are attacking them where they find them. For eight cases to occur in such a short space of time and all involve a perpetrator with a vehicle was an alarm bell on its own and a significant linkage analysis clue. Another aspect of the crimes that stood out as being similar and indicative of a serial offender was the fact that the perpetrator was taking mementos from the scene. In some cases, he took the victim's underwear, and in others, he took hair accessories. With a serial offender confirmed, Saps knew that they had to warn the public. This warning would take the form of a press release and would not only serve to create awareness and hopefully prevent future victims, but also encourage the public to call in with tips. 
It was at this point that the moniker, the Sunday Rapist, was first used. The press release also warned the public that although Lazan Farmer's death had seemingly not appeared intentional, the shortening period of time between crimes indicated that the perpetrator was escalating and there was a high likelihood that he would start killing his victims. The publicity brought in a huge number of leads and Captain de Toy would eventually identify 17 persons of interest across two provinces. Through systematic investigation, he was able to determine that the man that they were looking for was not on that list. Now, when a serial offender knows that the police are onto them and the net is closing in, two things can happen. Either they will start to escalate even further, in some way perhaps attempting to prove they are smarter than police, or they will go off the radar or move their crime somewhere else for a period. Of course, they don't stop entirely, and the period of time that they're able to hold out for differs from offender to offender. For this man, he decided to go off the radar, but it would be revealed he only managed to do so for just over six months. In July 2011, a young girl was accosted in Potrofström by a man with a gun. He attempted to force her into his vehicle, but failed. The victim did not report the incident to the police, unfortunately, but by some stroke of luck, a community member in Potrofström happened to hear about it and contacted de Toy. After interviewing this victim, Captain de Toy was able to determine that the offender had taken further measures to thwart the investigation. He changed the vehicle he was using. Up until this point, the perpetrator had been using a white Pajero single cab. Now, according to his new victim, he was in a silver double cab. From this incident, it is clear that although we know about the incidents that were reported to police, there are very likely many more that were not reported. These unreported incidents may well have been botched abduction attempts, or they may well have been completed rapes. We've already discussed why some survivors may not report kidnapping attempts, but there are even more reasons why rape survivors may not report, especially when the victims are so young. If a survivor felt that she may get into trouble from her parents or was perhaps ashamed to admit she'd been raped, it is highly likely that these girls would have tried to push the incident to the back of their minds and forget about it. So really, we don't know how many lives this man devastated, nor do we really know whether he was mostly inactive during this time, but we do know for sure that on Wednesday, the 12th of October 2011, the serial rapist that had been terrorizing two provinces in South Africa struck again, and this time there would be no doubt as to his intentions. 16-year-old Louise Duval lived with her mother Shireen in Rodeport. She attended De Berger High School and would walk the short distance to school each morning with her best friend. The name of Louise's friend is in the public domain, and she has done interviews with the press. The court ordered that her name be protected because she was a minor at the time, but she chose to tell her story. I have decided not to use the friend's name, because although it's easy enough to find, I'm always cognizant that people like to hop on social media after my episodes and get a personal view of the people involved. And although I'm sure you'd all be respectful of this young woman, I would hate to be the one to send a barrage of friend requests from strangers her way. Louise's mom spoke of her close relationship with her teenage daughter. On the weekends, they would sleep in late, and Louise would often climb into bed with her mom and they would cuddle and chat about their lives. On weekdays, when Louise had to go to school, she would get ready and then her mom would get up to make her breakfast. That Wednesday was no different. Shireen decided to get back into bed after making her daughter breakfast and as Louise prepared to leave, she called out to her mother that she loved her and she'd see her later. Shireen heard the door close. That was the last time she would ever hear her daughter's voice. 
Louise met up with her friend in their usual meeting spot. They had just 800 meters to walk until they'd be in the safety of the school grounds. Louise paused briefly and asked her friend to stop as she'd forgotten to put lotion on her legs and she wanted to do that quickly before they got to school. The sweet innocence of this very teenage girl act would soon become the opportunity a predator needed. As the girls paused on the side of the road, a silver-grey double-cab Toyota Bucky pulled up next to them. Louise's friend said that when the man got out, she thought he was going to ask for directions, but then she saw he had a gun. The man initially ordered both girls into the Bucky, but eventually stood between them and forced just Louise into the vehicle while her friend reached out to try and grab her. The man moved swiftly, though, and the girl was cognizant of the fact that he could shoot at any time. As soon as Louise was in the vehicle, he slammed the door shut, jumped into the driver's seat and sped away. The last image the girl had of her friend was Louise using hand signals to tell her to run away and call for help. In a state of shock, Louise's friend ran to Louise's house and started banging on the door, screaming for her friend's mom to open up. Shireen Duval had just drifted off to sleep when she heard the commotion outside. When she opened the door to the hysterical teenage girl, telling her that Louise had been kidnapped, she thought she must surely be joking. Within minutes, though, she realized the awful truth. Her daughter had been taken. The police were called, and upon hearing the details of the crime, immediately responded to Louise Duval's home. Warrant Officer Paul Fern and Warrant Officer Eurster from the Florida Police Station took a statement from Louise's friend and immediately put out a call for the vehicle described. As the offender had in all of his other crimes, the vehicle's number plates had been removed, and this in itself could be an identifying feature. A massive manhunt was launched for Louise and her kidnapper, and by another stroke of luck that this case seemed to attract, when Florida detectives wanted to get an identical drawn up, they called in, you guessed it, Warrant Officer Cornet Britz. She wasn't even halfway through her identical interview with Louise's friend when she asked the girl to pause for a minute and pulled the detectives aside. This perpetrator sounded terrifyingly familiar, and she immediately told them to get in touch with Captain de Toy. With her identical completed, the image was distributed along with Louise's photo to the Pink Ladies and Missing Children South Africa organizations, who circulated the flyer on social media. Shireen Duval was soon surrounded by friends and family, but her thoughts remained with her daughter. At that point, She had no idea that the man who'd taken her child was a wanted serial offender, but as the hours ticked by with no news, she became more and more afraid for her child's safety. In the Heiskanuot Vara Levens drama's episode of this case, Shireen says that around noon that day, she suddenly got a feeling she couldn't shake. It's something many mothers who've found themselves in this situation have mentioned and I can only explain it as being related to the bond that some parents have with their children. Shireen says that around that time, she felt that Louise was no longer alive. It would be many more hours before the news of the horrific discovery that had been made just the hour before would be made known to her, but she says in that moment, she knew she would never see her daughter alive again. Shireen got up, left her lounge which bustled with family and friends without a word, walked into Louise's room, closed the door, and lay down on her daughter's bed, sobbing into her pillow. At 10.55 that morning, on a farm in Maropeng just outside Michalisburg, a farmer noticed a patch of brush that had been set alight across the road from his farm. Fearing the flames would spread, he drove to put the fire out and investigate the cause. With the flames extinguished, the farmer approached what he said appeared to be a burnt-out log 
or perhaps even an animal carcass. It didn't take long for him to realize, to his horror, that he was actually looking at a human being. When police initially attended the scene, again, a completely separate police station from those dealing with the rape cases and the abduction of Louise Duval, with Maru Ping being at least an hour's drive from Florida, they secured the area and began forensic investigations. Although the body was severely burned and not identifiable in any way, two items had survived the fire, an earring and a belly button ring. The first step when any unidentified body is found is to check missing person records. Michalisburg police, of course, started with their own records and found none that matched. They then systematically approached each of the police stations in a radius around their jurisdiction, and when they spoke to Warrant Officer Eusta of Florida Police Station, he told them about Louise Duval. The size of the body certainly did not exclude it belonging to a teenage girl. When Eusta learned that two pieces of jewellery had been discovered, he immediately called Shireen to find out if Louise had a belly ring. This was not even something she'd thought of mentioning to police. But indeed, her daughter did have a belly ring. Later that afternoon, Warren's officer Eusta would arrive at the Duval's home with a belly ring in a plastic evidence bag. When Shireen Duval saw it, she knew her daughter was dead. Captain Detoy, in charge of the serial investigation, would also visit the scene at which Louise's body was found. When he talks about it in the television series, the camera has to cut away as he becomes overwhelmed with emotion. You can only imagine the images that are flashing through his head at that moment. And it is this that we would do well to remember when we denounce our entire police service based on our often uninformed opinions of what these people do on a daily basis. In that moment, standing over what remained of a vibrant teenage girl, the toy knew that the man he had been hunting for months, the one who had so cleverly evaded capture, was very likely responsible for this horrendous act. His serial rapist had escalated, and in the most gruesome way possible. While it would take some time for the news of Louise's murder to hit the news, tips were coming in from the coverage of her kidnapping, and Warrant Officer Eusta received an anonymous phone call. To this day, we do not know who put two and two together, but this is the power of speaking up. If you suspect that someone you know may be involved in a crime, make an anonymous call. It could very well be the difference between life and death for someone. The caller told Warrant Officer Eusta that there was a man who lived in Rurdapurt who had previously been convicted of kidnapping girls. The man's name was Yaku Stein. Johannes Jakuba Stein was 33 years old. He was a white male married with a six-year-old son. He lived in the Rurdakran suburb of Rurdapurt and was employed full-time at a carpentry company. In media reports, Stein is referred to as both Johannes and Yaku, but it seems that with his friends and family, he went by Yaku. Stein was an active member of his local Seventh-day Adventist church. On Wednesday nights, he often helped to run the youth club. Those who knew him described him as charming, kind and helpful. His co-workers said that they'd never seen an ounce of aggression from the man. Yaku Stein did have a record, though, one that his wife was aware of, but that had been painted to her in a very different light. No one else in Yaku's life was aware of his previous record, though, certainly not the parents of the children he worked with in the church's youth group, not his co-workers or his friends. Stain's record arose from the fact that a few years before, he'd abducted two young girls from a bus stop and sexually assaulted them. And this is where many WTF moments in this case happen. 
because Yakustain Stein was given community service as his punishment. He was convicted of kidnapping and sexual assault and ordered to carry out cleaning duties at a hospital every Sunday. So firstly, the fact that he was let off with community service blows my mind, but this was almost 20 years ago, so I can only hope that wouldn't happen today. Secondly, a sex offender is sent to carry out his community service in a hospital, where he will be in direct contact with all the people in that hospital. And if you think that his crimes being committed predominantly on a Sunday, and the fact that his community service was ordered on a Sunday, is a coincidence, think again. Because Yaku Stein was mandated to be carrying out this community service between 10 and 1 every Sunday, and he would occasionally arrive, but for the most part, he didn't, and no one noticed. When he realized that no one was actually keeping track of whether he was there or not, he decided to use that time for something entirely different, namely abducting, raping, and murdering young girls. I cannot explain the surge of anger that coursed through me when I realized that this man had done this, the complete middle finger to society. And yes, the fact that the system was supposed to be in place to protect people from this man and didn't even know he wasn't there. The community service, of course, was a great excuse for staying with his wife, because she knew he had to be at the hospital between 10 and 1 every Sunday, so she would ask no questions. When Warrant Officer Eurster saw the record that Stain had, he immediately searched the system for the man's address and cell phone number. With the address in hand, he contacted Warrant Officer Peterson of the Ruderport Police Station in whose jurisdiction Stain lived. When Peterson arrived at the address, he found no one home, but there was a silver Toyota double cab bucky parked outside the house, and in the back was a black rubbish bag. Inside the bag, Peterson discovered a school bag with the name Louise Duval written on it. In a nearby rubbish bin, Peterson found a SIM card from a cell phone. This would later be matched with Louise Duval's cell phone. With more than enough evidence to search the interior of the vehicle as part of a murder investigation, Peterson called in forensic services. They would find additional physical evidence inside the vehicle. By this time, the streets in which the Staines lived were swarming with police cars, and what the police officers did not know was that Yaku Stain had turned onto that street, seen the cars, and driven away. Stain had taken the family's other vehicle, a gold-coloured Mercedes-Benz, to collect his six-year-old son from school. It would later emerge that when he'd seen the police cars outside his house, he turned around dropped his son off at a friend's house, and then phoned his wife while he was driving. His wife would later testify that Stain had told her, quote, I kidnapped another child and did a terrible thing. I'm a monster and I'm going to run now, End quote. He also allegedly asked her to make sure she cared well for their son. Then the line went dead and the man's wife sat in complete shock and disbelief. She rushed home to find that her house was a crime scene. Upon identifying herself, police immediately began to question her about her husband's whereabouts. She told them everything she knew, and provided them with a description of, of the car he was in. By this time, Captain de Toy had been alerted to the development in the case, and rushed to the Stain house. Stan's wife agreed to take the forensic team and detectives through her house and allow them access to anything they needed. When she walked into her bedroom, she told the toy that something was strange. Her and her husband always kept their Bibles on their nightstand, but the Bibles had been removed. She eventually found them locked in a cupboard. From the physical evidence gathered on the scene, it became clear that Yaku Stain had abducted Louise Duval and brought her back to his house. She'd been kept in that house for at least two and a half hours. Unfortunately, due to the condition of her body, 
Injuries to her person could not be determined, but it's very likely that she was either knocked unconscious or strangled there too, before being placed into Stain's Bucky and driven out to the site where she was found. Horrifyingly, it would later be revealed after the autopsy that there was smoke and fragments of burned grass in Louisa's lungs. She had still been breathing when Yaku Stain set her alight. There is absolutely nothing that I can say that can make that knowledge any less horrific. I can only hope that Louise was not conscious when this happened and that she was not aware of what was happening. That is perhaps the only tiny piece of hope we can hold on to. It would emerge that after Yaku Stein fled the area, he went to Ferenikung. He visited a pastor friend of his and confessed to the crimes he'd committed. Police thought it possible that Stein may go to a family member for help, and they contacted and put alerts out to all the relevant people. Police were also monitoring cell phone activity on Stain's phone at this point. All of his family members were told that if he made contact with them, they should immediately tell him to phone Captain de Toy. There was no rest for the team that night, as they continued to trace Stain's movements and discovered that he seemed to be heading to KwaZulu-Natal. With the knowledge that Stain had a brother that lived in KZN, Police once again pleaded to the man that if his brother made contact, he should immediately phone de Toy. At 5.20am on the 13th of October, Stain's brother phoned de Toy and told him his brother had made contact and he'd given him de Toy's number. He said that Stain was threatening to take his own life. Shortly after putting down the phone with the brother, de Toy's phone rang again. It was Yaku Stain. The man told the police officer that he was going to suicide. For the next hour, Captain de Toy worked to talk Yaku Stain down. He told him that he couldn't change what he'd done, but he could start to make better decisions now for the sake of his family and society as a whole. Knowing that there was no way he could get to Stain in time, de Toy knew he had to talk him into handing himself over. The police captain who had so diligently worked the series thus far and just hours before stood over the decimated remains of a teenage girl, managed to keep his composure and stayed on the line with Stain until he arrived at Margate Police Station. Stain walked into the station with de Toy still on the line. De Toy asked him if he could see a police officer and Stain said he could. He told the man to approach the officer and hand him the cell phone. When the rather taken aback Margate police officer took the phone, de Toy identified himself, provided the case number for Louise Duval's murder, and instructed the officer to arrest Stain for her murder. The hour-long call ended only when the officer confirmed he had secured handcuffs around the wrists of the man who'd been terrorizing several communities for so long. Yaku Stain would initially be interviewed in KZN by senior members of police. He provided them with information as to where certain items related to Louise's murder could be found. This information was passed on to de Toy, and he was able to recover her house keys and items of clothing that Stain had dumped and attempted to burn up to 18 kilometres from where her body was found. On the 14th of October 2011, Stain was transported from KZN back to Gauteng and interviewed by Captain de Toy. At that time, he agreed to give a full confession to a magistrate, which he proceeded to do. Confessing to the murder of Louise Duval, as well as the abductions and rapes that had been linked to him. When Yaku Stain appeared in court for the first time the following Monday, journalists were ready with their cameras and although he was withdrawn and covered his face that first day, soon Stain became quite the showman with the press. Dr. Gerard Labaskakni explains that this is not uncharacteristic behaviour for many of the serial offenders he's worked with. They're initially unsure about their situation, 
But once they start to realize they're suddenly the center of attention in a courtroom, they play to that attention and milk it for all it's worth. For some, like Yaku Stain, that looks like smiling and posing for the photographers. For others, that looks like aggression, swearing and spitting at journalists. For those standing in the courtroom to bring you the news of the day, it's a mixed bag and they never really know what they're going to get. For one journalist, this trial would be even stranger, though. Pauli van Veek is an investigative journalist. She's also a very attractive woman, and it would emerge that Yaku Stein had become more than a little obsessed with the young journalist when she started covering his trial. Of course, it didn't seem to matter to Yaku that... The more he spoke to her, the more she wrote honestly about his abhorrent behaviour, never portraying him in anything but the negative light he deserved to be seen in. But he just seemed to enjoy interacting with her regardless of what her opinion of him was. And I guess that says everything that needs to be said about Yaku Stain's interactions with other human beings. Another element of serial offender behaviour that we've seen time and again is the attempt to retract confessions. Police know very well that even if they have a confession in front of a magistrate, they cannot rely solely on that as evidence, because in probably eight out of ten instances, the defendant will go back on that confession and claim it was coerced or that they weren't told their rights. And Yaku Stain was no different. He would go on to enter a plea of not guilty on every one of the 37 charges presented against him. He would also claim that both his wife and the pastor who he'd confessed to were lying. Stain's wife started divorce proceedings against him almost immediately after his arrest, and by the time the trial started in 2012, their divorce was finalised. The trial against Yaku Stain was always going to be a tale of two prospects, the state had a slam-dunk case against him for Louise's murder. There was almost no way he was getting out of it, even without the confession on the table. From the facts of that case, they could also use linkage analysis and what is called similar fact evidence to draw links between the other crimes, including the murder of Lausanne Farmer. But that would not necessarily be enough, and a toy knew he needed more. It would be the cell phone evidence that would really push the case over the top. The toy had all of the GPS coordinates from the various sites related to the cases, more than 20 different locations, and now he had access to Yaku Stain's cell phone information. So he painstakingly began the mammoth task of plotting out where Stain's cell phone was on the dates and times of the crimes, and without fail, on every single occasion, he was within a tower's distance of those GPS coordinates. Stain, of course, attempted to explain away that fact, and his explanations would get more and more ridiculous. Despite the fact that Louise's bag was found in his bucky, and there was significant physical evidence to place her in his house, Stain claimed that he'd actually been with a sex worker on that Wednesday, and he couldn't explain how the evidence had landed up in his house. As for some of the other dates, he claimed he was having an affair with a woman he'd met while doing his community service, and that he'd been with her on these occasions, having sex in his vehicle. That's why he was in these rural areas, he claimed. It was all just one big horrible coincidence. Even though there was little risk that a judge would really believe that this man's extramarital affair had somehow perfectly lined up with the actions of a serial rapist, the state wanted to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that his testimony was false. Initially, they'd been unable to trace the woman he referred to, but with the little detail the toy was given, he went to the DCS centre that handled the community service section and manually searched through over 1,000 records until he found the woman Stain was talking about. He then tracked her down and personally delivered her to the court so that this woman could testify that she had never in her life had an affair with Yaku Stain 
and that she had most certainly not been with them on the days he claimed. In another situation that really made the amazing work of police shine through in this case, it was discovered that a doctor in one of the Rustenburg cases had incorrectly completed a J88 form, which is the document used to record injuries sustained by victims of a crime, including rape. The incomplete document meant that the victim in question may have had her charges thrown out of the case, but de Toy, despite finding that the doctor had moved to another province, tracked the man down and brought him to court to testify so that the charge could remain on the sheet. A trial within a trial would be held to determine the admissibility of Stane's confession, and the judge would rule that he'd provided the confession freely and of his own will, and that he was not coerced or forced into it, and none of his rights were violated. The confession was then added to the evidence pack. Over 60 witnesses were called by the state over a three-week period. The rape survivors all testified in camera as they were minors at the time of the crimes being committed against them, and even the ones who had since aged out of that group were not forced to testify in person unless they wished to. Captain de Toy single-handedly coordinated all of these witnesses to ensure that they were in court when they needed to be. Saps would later commend de Toy and prosecutor Karina Kutsia for, on occasion, even paying the transport fees for witnesses out of their own pockets when the court employee responsible for that function was not available. Louise's mom, Shireen, sat through the entire trial. She was devastated to hear the pathologist's testimony about what had likely happened to her daughter. She said that she felt she had failed to be there for her daughter when she needed her, so the least she could do was sit through the trial and make sure she got justice for her. At one point, Shireen approached Yaku Stain and shouted at him, telling him that she is Louise's mother and he murdered her child and he's going to get what's coming to him. Stain didn't even bother to make eye contact with the woman and had no reaction to her words at all. On the 18th of September 2012, Yaku Stain was found guilty on 33 of the 37 charges against him. He was found guilty of Louise Duval's murder, but unfortunately because her body had been so badly damaged, it was not possible to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that he had raped her, so he was found not guilty of that charge. In the matter of Lazanne Farmer's death, he was found guilty of culpable homicide. He was found not guilty on three of the other charges, but overall, the prosecution was a resounding success. In the sentencing phase, psychologist Franco Fisser testified that Yaku Stain ranked very high on the psychopathic tendency scale and that he had significant narcissistic traits. He also said that if Stain was released, there was no doubt that he would offend again, both as a rapist and a murderer. On the 19th of September 2012, Yaku Stain was sentenced to five life sentences plus 170 years. After the sentencing, Stain called Captain de Toy over and asked if he could arrange for him to meet all of his victims in person so that he could apologize. De Toy, horrified that Stain would even ask this, told the man he had absolutely no right to even think about those girls ever again, never mind see them face to face. Yaku Stain was initially sent to Leocorp prison to serve his sentence, but in 2014, news leaked that he'd been apprehended while attempting to escape. Stain had taken part in a plan led by Nigerian terrorist Henry Okra, Observant wardens noticed saw marks on the cell bars where Stain and four other inmates were housed and immediately isolated and separated the group. Stain was then sent to Pretoria's C-Max prison to serve out the rest of his sentence, and he remains there to this day. Shortly after sentencing, Captain de Toy was contacted by Louise Duval's sister. She wanted to know if it was possible for them to get her sister's school case back. Captain de Toy, of course, agreed, 
and arranged to meet the woman at a local shopping centre on the weekend. He describes this meeting as one of the most emotional of his career, because at that moment it felt like he was giving back all that there was left of Louise. It was the final act in a sequence of events that had devastated countless people and one that would stay with Captain de Toy for the rest of his life. He says that his only regret is not being able to save Louise. Consciously, he knows that he did everything he could, but he still lives with that on a daily basis. He also acknowledges that Louise's death saved countless others, because when Stain took her, he broke all his own rules. There's no doubt that when he chose to take Louise to his house that day, he knew that he would kill her. Something changed in him. He must have known that it would only be a matter of time before he was caught. Sadly, for Louise, it would be her death that would bring him down. The scale of devastation, trauma and heartbreak in this case is just beyond comprehension, and I fully believe we're only looking at the surface of it. The survivors of this man's crimes have to live with the trauma of their experiences for the rest of their lives. The two friends who were the last friendly people to look in the eyes of Lausanne Farmer and Louise Duval before their murders have to live with those memories every single day. Every time they have some moment of joy in their lives, it will always be tinged by an edge of guilt that they survived and their friend did not, even though that guilt is certainly not theirs to carry. 14-year-old Lizanne Farmer was brave and quick-witted. She made a decision in that moment that she let go of her friend's hand and opened that car door. She wasn't going to let this man win. Her death is solely on the head of one person, but her loss is felt by so many. 16-year-old Louise Duval was funny, bubbly and kind. She was her mom's best friend, and Shireen admits that her family has been torn apart by Louise's death. No one should ever have to have the label of being the one that saved others through their death. But whether or not Louise knew it, as she was taking her final breath, she did. And although that is a powerful memory to have of her, it's not how she should be remembered. Because if she could have chosen, I have no doubt she would have chosen to live. But that choice was taken away from her. I think that sometimes adding this extra label to victims of them having saved others helps us to feel better about what happened to them. And yes, we can certainly acknowledge that aspect. But the truth is, Louise Duval should never have had to have the weight of that responsibility placed upon her. That man put it there, though. And in the end, it was him that made the choices. To all the survivors of this horrifying series of crimes, may you continue to live in power, hold your heads up high, and celebrate your strength. Lizanne Farmer and Louise Duval, rest gently. Thank you for listening to episode 79, The Serial Crimes of Yaku Stain. If you'd like to hear more victim-focused true crime content, please subscribe to True Crime South Africa on the platform you're using to listen right now. If you're looking for something still related to real-life stories, but often with a more positive slant, you can check out my new podcast series, I Live Through This. You can follow both podcasts on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, thank you for your support, and I'll chat to you soon. <laughs>